let's get into our wonderful webcast here. You know, I love these AT&T ads. You know, it's not complicated. Do you want better results or worse results? I, I love these ads. And, and so, of course, in our case, we want better results. So today, we want to talk about how leading indicators and dashboards can actually help us get better results. Well, better results sounds good, but it sounds like a lot more work to do. And that's what I hear often from teams and CEOs. Yeah, so today we're going to show that it actually allows us to do more and with less work. So let's, let's take a look at that. Okay. okay? And so, um, you know, sometimes we see, I feel like I'm working really hard and not getting really good results. And I wonder if uh, anyone else in the audience uh, feels that way sometimes. You feel like you're pushing this huge big rock. And, and that's how sometimes work feels, we're overwhelmed. So you basically have two choices when you have this huge big rock. You know, you can either work harder and push harder or you know, you can work different. Now today we're going to show you how to use KPIs to push on the right things, to move that big rock and get uh, better, better results. Um, most of us as, as business owners have tried to measure what we're doing in our business and we basically have a couple of different types of KPIs. So today Patrick, and we're going to help build awesome KPIs and dashboards and we're also going to help you move those big rocks so that, uh, you know, the ones that seem heavy. We'll use two types of indicators. One is a leading indicator and the other is a results indicator. And if you drop that weight of a result indicator on top of your team, then when it's good, well, we celebrate. But when things are bad with your result indicators, well, sometimes it feels like a really heavy weight on the team or like that huge rock you talked about. Here's what happens. It causes a negative pressure that may discourage your team and creating a feeling of helplessness. They feel like uh, they're falling short. So your team members will say things like, well, we're really working hard, but we're not getting anywhere. One major reason for that is that teams can't change lagging indicators or a result indicator after the fact. So today we're going to look at how can we then use a leading indicator. How do we use leading indicators to help us get there? We're going to use chapter 8 of your book, Patrick, to make us uh, make the points and also to help us figure out how can we have this positive energy that drives results that motivates you or your team towards solutions, and that's the discussions that we want to have. So in coaching clients, I've seen a positive side benefit as well. One of them is that utilizing leading indicators can have a very positive impact on morale. So today, we're sharing just part of one chapter. It's chapter eight from the book Rhythm. It's just come out, and we're going to talk about the power of leading indicators and dashboards. Uh, so when we were preparing, Barry, you asked me why we jumped to chapter 8, not chapter 1. Well, and you know, I bet some yeah. people wanted the same thing. Because, I, you know, Patrick, I realized how much time and energy you spent on organizing the book, getting things in the right order and laying it out in a way that was very easy to follow, like a manual how-to. Yes. So, so why you can, Well, you can read this book from cover to cover, right? Uh -huh. Or you can just jump to somewhere where you're having some pain. In. And so uh -huh. today we're going to focus on KPIs, and then you can just jump to chapter 8 we talk about leading indicators and dashboards. So uh, today what I want to do is think about it from the departmental or functional area as well. Because you know, after all, most of us are working with or in departments where the real work is done. So we want to show KPIs in action over a 13-week quarter. I want to help you see uh, how this works with both results indicators as well as uh, leading indicators. I think sometimes um, people ask me, hey, you know, do I need both? And yes, the answer is you absolutely, absolutely need both. So we're going to start with sales here. Okay. We're going to use an example from a customer. Yeah, and so as we talked about this, we decided we'd use a client example from a KPI deep dive coaching session. So our example today is a software company. They were struggling to get their sales consistently performing well, even predictable. And so our client started mainly just using KPIs. And what we're going to show you is how we help them to tweak using general KPIs, mostly results KPIs, to use a leading indicator to help them as well. Yeah, so we're going to do what I call a bold comparison today. First, we're going to show you how they were using a result indicator uh -huh. uh, before we did our deep dive session. And then I'll show you how we added a leading indicator that could help drive the results better. You know, so Barry, for, for this, uh, for this uh, discussion, you're going to be a sales manager for a minute, okay, so we can show uh, what happened with the clients. And so let's begin by making sure we know what success looks like. Their leading, their, their result indicator that they were looking at was uh, sales dollars closed. And so the red, yellow, green success criteria for this result KPI uh, is that the goal is to hit a million dollars in sales. The stretch goal is 1.25 million. 
and uh, anything below 700,000 is just not acceptable. So that would be the red area that we want to avoid. So Barry, as a sales manager, how do you feel about this target here? Well, uh, that's, that's what we agreed to. It's a real stretch, but it seems reasonable. Okay, so let's be clear. Uh, the one million dollars needs to be a goal that you signed up for as the sales manager to achieve. It's not a stretch. The stretch is the 1.25 million. So the million is not a stretch. Can we agree on that today? Okay, yeah, I can agree to that. I sign up for a million, a million dollars every year. Yeah, and so guys, you know, I hope you're going to enjoy this. We'll do a little bit of role playing here. These are some actual conversations that we have with our clients. And today I want to really kind of dig deeper and help you guys get some of the finer points that happen in, in, in helping clients get stronger and better so you guys can do the same. I see this all the time. Uh, people say, you know, the, the goal is a million and the sales manager says, yup, 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 that's a stretch. Uh, we need to pause right there like we did with Barry and go, wait, wait, wait a minute. Let's be clear. That's not a stretch, guys. We expect that. You better sign up for that. And that's what we just did. Did you feel the heat, Barry? I did. I felt the heat. And, got to feel the heat. And, and I've got to let you know that's not unusual. I feel it here sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> that's good, man. Okay. So, Barry, now this is week two. All right. This is a 13-week race. Uh, we typically start the quarter strong and optimistic. So, Barry, you're the sales manager again. Are we good this quarter? And I'm glad you stopped me in the hallway and asked that question. Yeah, we're good. Uh, we look good. The pipeline's good. I'm actually feeling good about making my $1 million quota right now. That's, that's awesome. Now, we move into week seven. Now this is halfway through the quarter, and here's where people get a bit, a bit anxious about making a number. So Barry, does it still look good here in the middle of the quarter? Well, you've caught me again, Patrick, and I'm glad to answer. Sales are converting a little slower, but the deals that I have are good. They're high quality, so yeah, I'm, I'm feeling pretty good about this. Okay, uh, and so, so now we're into week 11, and you notice that uh, you status yellow in weeks 9 and 10, and now I see that we're back to green. Yeah, uh, i got to tell you, in weeks 9 and, and 10, we had some deals that were stalled. They got hung up. Part of it was because of the people that needed to sign, et cetera. They were out of town. So I was worried at that time that we might not close the deals. But I, I think we're back on track now. I feel pretty good here in week 11. Okay, that's good. So now, Barry, what happened? We, we finished the quarter. Uh, it looks like we have green statuses for 11 and 12 weeks. And then... On week 13, we missed a number. I feel blindsided based on our previous conversations and that this dashboard was green in weeks 11 and 12. Yeah, uh, Patrick, I, I'm sorry about that, but I really expected two deals to close last week and it got pushed. So uh, don't worry, there. we're going to close them next quarter. Okay, but now is that for next quarter's quota or is that for this quarter's quota? Well, uh, no, that's for this quarter. This quarter. Okay, so... So what that means is that we would do a million dollars uh, next quarter plus these two deals. So to make it up next quarter, you'll have to do 1.35 million because as you can see, the red criteria here is 700,000 and we only did 650K. So you're saying we're going to catch up. Is that what you're saying? We're going to change our goal. We're going to do a million uh, 0.35 for the next quarter. Well, that's not really what I, I said. Well, actually, you did say that. Whether you meant to or not, you did say that, and now you've, you've got to, you're saying you're going to make it up. Well, I, I don't know. I mean, you know, next quarter, $1 million is going to be pretty tough to make just by itself. It's a, statistically and, and historically, it's kind of a tough quarter. Okay, so that's great. We're going to get our role play now. Let me make a couple of points. And so, so this is how, guys, it feels to get blindsided, right? And so let's see how we, we help this client change the discussions and so that they can have a different approach. By the way, this approach of just using a results indicator, it's not a bad approach. It, it works uh, half of, most of the time until you get blindsided, then you wonder if there's a better way. And unfortunately, that's kind of what happened to me uh, before, and that's why we're doing what we're doing these days. So now let's talk about using a leading indicator. So we added a leading indicator. Uh, we added customer product demos. And here's how we came up with that. So we're, we're going to get you back into sales manager mode here. Uh, as we help design this. So Barry, how do you know if you will achieve the million dollar quota? Well, I'll just look at my pipeline. Really? Why? So, so how does your pipeline help you to predict that? Well, as you know, we instituted a multi-stage sales process. So I look at stage six, which is the last stage of our sales cycle, and then I just look at what the, the dollars are in the pipeline there. Okay. And then uh, what is your close rate there? 
Well, we close about about 40% of that last stage. Pretty sure it's about 40%. Okay. And what do you do when your 40% estimate close uh, actually is less than quota? How do you actually fix that? Well, we need to get uh, more money in the, the pipeline, or we need to increase, in, increase our closing rate. It's got to be one of the two. So I'm thinking that uh, of those two, it's probably better to work on closing more money in the pipeline, getting more in there, because we've already tried to work on closing ratios, and it hasn't worked very well. And how do you get more money into the pipeline? Well, the main thing in our business is getting demos done for customers. We've got to get in front of them, and 70% of these demos tend to proceed to stage six. So demos is how we can move the needle. And in, in that case, how are demos coming along today? Well, uh, they're actually kind of pretty slow right now. Sometimes by the time we actually schedule the demo, the prospect has waited a couple of weeks, and, and they've changed their mind or their schedule's changed. And I guess that's probably bad. So what can we do about that? Anything we can do about that? Yeah, well, uh, we could focus on making sure that we get the demo scheduled every week. You know, I, I, I think I actually like demos as opposed to the pipeline. Okay, so that's, that's, that's good. So we'll use demos as our leading indicator. Okay. Okay. So guys, you know, I, I want you to notice, I asked about six, seven questions, maybe eight questions. We dug real deep, and we'll come back to this point. This is one of the pitfalls that a lot of companies don't do well. So I'm going to come back and address this a little bit. But I want you to see and hear, I should say, how, how, we, how we did that. So we're going to use this leading indicator. And here's our red, yellow, green. We want to get two demos per week. Um, and we want to, you know, the stretch goes for. If we didn't get any demos done, of course, that's bad. That's, that's, that'll be zero. That's red. And so, again, we start off week one full of promise and optimism. So, so Barry, we're going to get you back into uh, sales manager mode here. And what happens is that we move to week three, and we notice that, um, that, uh, that we have a red, which means zero. So, so, Barry, it's week three. And what happened to our demos, man? Well, we, we just couldn't get any schedules. Couldn't get them on the, on the book. Okay. Well, uh, okay. So, what's the action plan then? How do we how do we solve this? Um, well, I guess that we need to check, or I should check with Jack. You know, he handles the pre-sales and he gets the demos scheduled. Well, what what accounts are actually waiting for the demo? Do you actually have accounts waiting for demos? And if you do, how many are there? Uh, I th I think now we've got about five accounts that actually need demos right now. Great, great. So, so what does it take to do all five of them like next week? catch up because you were read this week. Well, I, I don't think I can get more than three done, certainly not four or five. I, I think three is probably the number. Okay, three is good. Three is better than zero, so that's cool. Uh, but this has nothing to do with Jack, right? right? So, so how do we get these accounts to meet with us for their demos? Well, you know, I, I guess I just I need to call them today. Great. That's a great action plan. That's a good action plan for this week. So you're going to call them today. So we move into week four. So, Barry, we're in week four, man. Now, what happened? I mean, we talked about it last week, and we said we're going to make those calls and, and schedule. How come it's still red? What happened to your action plan of getting three prospects scheduled? Well, I, you know, I made the calls. It took me a while to connect with some of them. And then when I checked, well, the, their schedules were full. So I was able to schedule a couple of them for week five. How do we push harder to get these demos? What do you think? Well, in my, in my sales meetings this week, uh, I'll lay out all the demos for the quarter, and now I'll push each of our sales reps to give us some specifics and what leads they're going to be talking to on what day over the next three, four weeks. Uh, I just don't think I can schedule more than three, maybe a month out, maybe four weeks in advance. Okay, so your action plan is to schedule uh, demos for the next four weeks. You know what? I like that action plan. That's a, that's a good action plan. Let's, let's, let's see how that rolls. And so after a few weeks of discussion on demos, wow, look at week eight. You really super greened it this week, right? You knocked it out of the park. Man, I, I feel good about it, too. I feel good about the demos for the next four weeks, and we just we look great as a sales team. Okay. So we're at week eight. Um, what did we learn so far this quarter that we can apply to make the rest of the quarter really rock? <laughs> you had to ask me. We've got to get our, our demos scheduled, and we've got to get each of our sales reps. And I have to take each one of those sales reps and get them to commit with customer names, and I found that was very helpful this uh, last few weeks. We've got to get that pre-sales resource scheduled, and I know it's crazy, but we got to get customers to be able to schedule it. So four weeks in advance has actually been a, that's been a good uh, a good forecast for me. Excellent, excellent. Okay, so we we uh, we finished the quarter. We were green. So Barry, you did much better this quarter than last quarter. You didn't blindside me. Didn't surprise me. 
Yeah, uh, I think it was all because of the demos, but you know what? I have a couple right now that are about to close. I was really hoping that I'd be super green this quarter, but uh, they're going to be pushed into the next quarter. And you can start next quarter strong. Yes, indeed. Okay, so guys, what we just did was I did a bold comparison. We did the role play to show you what it felt like to only work with a result indicator uh, versus you know using a, a um, both the result indicator and the leading indicator that drives the results. Well, right? it's one of the ways that rhythm helps companies and helps us to be better in our business. Yeah, and I want you guys to notice that um, you know the KPI is the KPI, but really the the more important thing is the discussion that Barry and I had. In other words, we worked on coming up with the action plan because sometimes some of our clients would say, "Hey, you know what? We've got red." but nothing's moving, and then when I ask them what actions they've taken, they haven't taken much action. So, so um, the key thing here, guys, is to focus on the leading indicator and then focus on having discussions and get to actions. Okay, so Barry, who's this dude? Uh, it's Michael Jordan. No, 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 the, the guy is kissing. Ah, that's, uh, that's Dean Smith. Okay, Dean Smith. And so I want to emphasize this point again, actually. He, um, he wrote this book, The Carolina Way, with, uh, with Dr. Jerry Bell. And uh, I, was, I, I met Jerry Bell, I uh, actually had a session with him a few weeks ago, and he shared with me in the book that um, Dean Smith really only talks about winning once in the entire season. He said on the first day of the season, to let everyone know that they got to win. And then he never talks about winning anymore. And what he does after that is he focuses on getting people to work hard on their skills, working smart, being committed, and then working together as a team. So you can think of it as his leading indicators were whether or not their basketball skills were getting stronger, whether they were committed, and whether their teamwork was getting better. If, they, if he focused on those three things, then, uh, then, uh, then, then, he, then they have, as you know, he's got a great winning record. So the key lesson here is, you know, what's the best leading indicator for you? Um, you know, you've got to ask more questions. You know, which one is it? Is it customer demos? Is it the last stage of the sales pipeline, number of leads generated? You know, which one, which one's the best one for you? And I think, you know, the best one for you is the best one for you based on what problem you're tackling. And it does change over time. In the poll, we, we said that some people change their KPIs occasionally. I would suggest that you actually take a look at your leading indicators every quarter. Ask yourself if you're still working on the right problems. Because sometimes if you've solved that problem already, you may want to move your leading indicator to somewhere else in your process. Uh, hey, Ryan, I think it's a good time for us to, to pause and see if uh, there's any questions out there. Yes, absolutely. So if you have questions, please use the question control panel and the go to webinar control panel and uh, type your questions in. Uh, looks like we have a, a couple coming in already. Uh, here's one from Howard. Howard's asking, does there always have to be a leading indicator for a result indicator? Uh, so I would, I would say that leading indicators help you to focus on what you can leverage and drive results faster. That is the more effective way of moving your results indicator. I'm not going to say always, because if I say always, somebody will always find an exception. So I would say, yeah, in most cases, Work hard to get yourself a leading indicator because I think you'll find that you'll get better results that way. And as I showed you in the last um, example, have both of them on your dashboard. Thanks, Patrick. Here's a question from Paul. Paul's asking, what's your best way to identify early indicators or a leading indicator? Is this the best way to identify them? So the best way, now did, did, Paul, did Paul give you a category, a specific uh, business problem? No, nope, no specific category, just the best general way to identify them. So the best general way, uh, I'm going to cover that in the next section of, I've got a four-step process, but a quick answer to you, Paul, is that um, you've got to ask a lot of questions. So what I demonstrated just now with Barry was when we drilled in and asked questions to get to a leading indicator for sales. So that would be the best way, is to just ask a lot of questions. And, and, and get yourself going. And I would also add that uh, it's more important that you get started with a leading indicator than being worried about getting the right one. And Jennifer is asking, what if I cannot find a leading indicator? So that's okay. You know, the world isn't going to end. In fact, you're probably doing okay. The question is, how can you do even better? How can you get into a rhythm of doing better? So I think you'll be more effective with one. So take a break. Ask someone to work with you and discuss. I find it really hard to brainstorm with a mirror. 
So you know, ask ask somebody uh, what what they think, and ask them to ask you some questions because questions will help you find the right leading indicator. And then in conjunction with Paul's question, you know, pick something and start measuring that, baseline that, see if you're making the right adjustments in your weekly meetings. And if you are, then that's good. Run with it. If you're not, then you may need to go back and find another one. Patrick, I would add that I've also found with teams that I've worked with, and, and you're questioning me sometimes, about the point that I become uncomfortable, you're about halfway there. Yeah, that's, you know, right. that's about the halfway point right. when you you see someone gets uncomfortable. So we're going to get into the methodology here a little bit, Ryan. Any other questions before I get going? Yeah, there's one one more here from Eric. He's saying generally multiple people have opinions on leading indicators. What what's the best way to appease you know multiple people that you know have different opinions to come to one solution? Do you just try all of them? What what do you do in that scenario? So when you have multiple people with, uh, with opinions, it may be that they didn't follow the questioning process because what I like to do is have the same people in the room uh, ask the questions and we will have a discussion and we generally can get down to, uh, to a couple. And now we get down to a couple, I would say, you know what, just go measure two of them to get going. It's okay. And then you find out uh, which I like, you know, less is more, but it's okay to have a couple of leading indicators to help you with the result. No, not a problem there. So one additional thing that I found is sometimes you can flow chart something and it helps people identify how to get to the earliest indicator. It's not that the other ones are bad, but they yes. want to work on the earliest indicator to drive the right results. Yep, that works well too. So Ryan, I'm going to move on, okay? If there's any other questions, please save it for the end. We'll have more Q&A time. All right, let's so go. Ch chapter 8, Chapter eight: the power of leading indicators and dashboards. Uh, uh, so. Um, you know, Winston Churchill said, it's no use saying we are doing our best, but you've got to succeed in doing what is necessary. Well, that's a quote that came right out of your book there. Yes, yes. Um, I think that, you know, I have quotes in, the, in every chapter of the book. Uh, these are quotes that were actually meaningful to me as we found ways to improve. Okay. So that's, that's what that is. Okay, so hey, you know, uh, in this chapter, I got these four steps. And so four step process to develop leading indicators. And in chapter eight, I talk about these four steps, and and um, and uh, we and let's show how we can develop the KPI from the last example that we did using this four right. steps. Right. And that's actually straight out of the book on page one fifty nine for those of you who already have a copy. Yep. So the four steps are, you know, first you got to know what problem you're trying to tackle. And I'm going to share with you. Lots of people don't really slow down enough to know what problem they're trying to tackle. Don't just measure a KPI for measurement's sake. And then secondly, you've got to know how to describe success. Uh, and I know this sounds very basic, but it's amazing how many clients I see that don't have this basic done. And so I like to use a result indicator uh, to do this. And then step three, this one's the hardest. You must dig deep with questions to get this leading indicator. And finally, step four, to drive results. You're not done unless you have red, yellow, green for the leading indicator so that you can measure against something objective and then um, just like we demonstrated in a number of demos per week in our last example. Well, it seems pretty simple, but... Yeah, it's actually pretty simple. Unfortunately, just not easy. Mm -hmm. So one of the biggest pitfalls I see uh, is not focused on solving the business problems. People usually tell me that they want to measure stuff. But when I pause and ask them why, and what results are they trying to improve, they have, they have trouble really explaining that to me. That's the first uh, step one. Step two is, is the desired result. You know, let's make sure we can describe what success looks like. So <coughs> the leading indicator tool that you received, um, I'll show it to you now. Uh, you know, so the question that we asked in the last demo was how do we make sales, how do we make quota every quarter? Not just make quota, by the way, but make quota every quarter. And so, so again, it's simple, not necessarily easy. Sometimes people would say, my business problems, I just want to, get my sales going, or I just want to hit my numbers. Uh, but let's be more specific. In this case, uh, they, want to, they want to make quota every quarter. And so the desired outcome is, a, is an engine that closes sales every quarter, not just one quarter, uh, but every quarter. And then after that, if we looked at the KPI, we used the KPI, which was uh, sales dollars closed. And if you recall, we set the goal that a million was green, that's the goal. Uh, 1.25 million was the stretch goal. And then less than 750k was 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 not acceptable, 
And then in step three, dig deeper with questions. So, but we dug deeper, but that's how, uh, you know, typically people stop at about three questions. We go back to our example, Patrick. Uh, we would have stopped at stage six of the pipeline. That's where we would have quit. That's right. That's right. And we got there with these questions. Uh, how do you know if you will achieve the $1 million quota? And then we said, you know, how does your, your pipeline help you predict? And then what is the close rate at stage six of the pipeline? Because that's what you said was, in, was important to you, was stage six. And usually, Barry, that's where people stop. Right, but you know, we kept digging. We got out our shovels and worked harder and kept digging there, and that's how we arrived at actually a stronger leading indicator. It was one that drove discussions and actions that you and I had in our example. You asked me more questions, like, and what do you do when you 40% estimate uh, for closing is not, you don't hit that number? How do you get more money in the pipeline? You asked me about demos, and how do we move that needle? How are the demos coming? And then you ask me, what can you do about that? How can you move it? And that's actually when we came to that better leading indicator when yep. we got there. That's right. Uh, by the way, this was actually a real, real customer example. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and so, you know, people who asked the questions earlier about, you know, which is the right leading indicator, you know, that stage six of the sales pipeline, that's where most people stop. And that's not a bad leading indicator. It's just not as good as the one we came up with when we helped them dig deeper for a few more questions. It's also, where as a sales manager, I started to become uncomfortable, as we talked about. So you knew it was time to start pushing just a little further. Yeah, you were lucky that was a role play. Imagine the real story. <laughs> okay, so finally, step four is to drive results. And you always need clear success criteria. I was really surprised, and I always take the, the regular green thing for granted. And I'll share with you, I just came back from a session with a, with a company called Veeam. And Veeam is a rocking software company, super fast growth. Uh, and... Um, the CEO shared with me uh, that, you know, Patrick, before we finish our session, I'd like you to spend a little bit more time helping my team, you know, do the regular green stuff. And I always think, wow, you know, you guys can probably do that on your own, uh, but it's amazing how many clients have said to me, yeah, but if we just don't seem to take the time unless you're here to help us. So even the companies which are growing fast and, and larger tend, to, tend to, new, to need this. So you need this. Okay, so clear criteria and KPIs give you a tool for your discussions and solutions, but when you want to push, you push on that leading indicator, not the results indicator. That's sort of the big rock, and that's where your power comes from, isn't it? That's right. So to finish up this form here, we had a number of customer product demos, and then we, um, <coughs> we figured out, you know, two would be the goal per week, four was the stretch goal, of course zero is unacceptable, and then finally the test. You know, does your leading indicator predict the right results and is it within your control? So, you know, we checked on that and then after that, now you can run your 13-week race. Right, so now we use this dashboard to run our 13-week races like you talked about in, in Chapter 7 of the book Rhythm and uh, how we demonstrated it just now. That's right, Chapter 7 I actually call your, this a 13-week race and I talk about how important that is. Uh, so that's the methodology, simple but unfortunately not as easy to do. So Ryan, any, any uh, questions I can take before I move into our next example of the manufacturing? Yeah, I have a couple and uh, as I'm asking these, if you have questions, please uh, put them in your control panel. Steven's asking, uh, how do I know if my leading indicator should be about a number, be about number of leads generated or number of proposals? How do I know? Yeah, so you know, as, so this is really every every uh, business has their own individual problems that they're trying to solve. So I would say it depends on the business problem you're solving. So ask a few more questions, like I did of Barry earlier. If you do not have enough uh, leads coming to the funnel, you might want to focus on the front end of the funnel, and therefore you may pick number of leads generated. But let's say you're having trouble moving things through the funnel. In other words, you got lots of leads, but they're kind of stuck in the middle of the funnel. Then maybe you want to focus on number of uh, proposals. So actually, in that previous example for that, for that software company, they had no problems with leads, and that's why they realized that the constraint in their system was actually the number of demos. So, so by focusing on that, we actually got them to also improve their practices as well, and the process as well of getting the right, you know, more, de more demos through the system. Now, I got another question here from Joan. Uh, Joan's asking, should all my sales reps carry the same KPIs? You know, that's actually not a bad idea. So what you could do is you could have all the sales reps carry the same KPIs so that when you guys have your weekly meetings, 
you got the right things to discuss, but then have different success criteria that's based on regions. In other words, a bigger region may have a, a different success criteria than a smaller region. Okay, great. I think that's, uh, wait, okay, so I have a question here from, from Dale. He says, I'm in three different regions of operations. Is it okay for each region to determine their own KPIs and leading indicators? Uh, so <clears throat> it is definitely okay. Uh, I would say, first of all, here's the question I would ask, right? Are the regions working on different problems? They have different problems to solve. So for example, maybe one region has an operational issue of trucks, another one has a different one. So then yes, I, I, would, I would use uh, different KPIs if that is the case. However, if they don't have different problems to solve, then I would strongly push them towards a single set of KPIs that can be shared across the regions. Thanks, Patrick. Let's move along for uh, the sake of time. Okay, so our, our last example is about manufacturing. And what we, we want to demonstrate over 13 weeks using both the result indicator and a leading indicator. So I've chosen Patrick uh, Safety as our example for manufacturing. It's a common issue. It challenges many companies. And we want to improve safety and we want to reduce injuries. Actually, we'd like to eliminate them. So we're going to show you how to do this with your dashboard with one result indicator and with one leading indicator. OK, that's great. So we've gone through at this point, as you can see on the dashboard, for safety and reportable injuries, we've gone through seven weeks with no injuries. Right, we're reporting this off the result indicator, seven weeks with no injuries. So this is good, uh, but it doesn't actually help us with prevention, right? This actually reports that we have had no injuries. That's right, it's an after the fact, so nobody's been hurt and we don't have to be concerned about how bad because they weren't. But in this case, uh, it could lull us into complacency. Result indicators make a poor gauge of prevention. For example, when our managers see a low injury rate from this results indicator, it's all green, they may become complacent. They might actually skip things like a safety briefing that we might have every morning for our shift or for our teams. Yeah, because everything looks great, right? Right. And we have lots of, all the time, lots of work to do. Rather do that work instead of the safety briefing. Absolutely. I have a lot of pressures on me as a leader, don't I? Yeah, well, no. And then, and then, and then, and then of course, kablam. Right. Yeah. <laughs> so now we gain, all of a sudden, we had an injury and we've gone red. And you know, based on our, uh, based on the criteria that we set, our red, yellow, green criteria, greater than or equal to one major injury, well, that means that we're red for the rest of the quarter. So based on that, the result indicator is going to be red. And this is what I meant by having this sense of helplessness earlier when I talked about the team doesn't feel like they can do anything about it. We see the dashboard, we know we're red, but there's nothing we can do for the remaining five weeks. It's going to change that result from red. Well, it just can go from red to deep red. <laughs> That's right. Exactly. Somebody else gets injured is worse. Yeah. Okay. That's right. This is where, you know, the boss comes to us and says things like, be safe, stop being careless, look out for one another, watch each other's backs, and that kind of thing. Yeah, and, and those are unfortunately uh, not helpful questions, not helpful statements. You know, be safe, stop being callous. It's like, these are not solution-oriented, they're not actionable. And by, by the way, did you think we wanted to get injured just for fun? I don't right? think so. No, of course not. So, so um, you know, managers were listening in. Just be careful what you say to your employees. I mean, most of us already know when we've made a mistake, uh, or, or especially in safety when our finger is really cut off. So, so being safe and stop being callous, that's not very, very helpful, a bit demotivating, actually. Cool. And so because of our indicators, you can see for the next rest of the quarter, uh, it's red, red, and red for the rest of the quarter. Well, that's right. So let's show the, how the leading indicator might help us and give us a rhythm to be better for the rest of the quarter. And I think that's the important part is having a rhythm to be better for the rest of the quarter and beyond. Exactly. So the leading indicator shows here in week four, it's just gone red, that we're not in a good rhythm. We're not taking training seriously. We've been reactive, but we're basically inconsistent. And how do you tell that we're inconsistent? Well, I can see that we've gone from green in the first week to yellow, and then we go back to green, and now we're at red. Right. So we reacted, but we're not consistent. We're not getting better. That's right. We've apparently not built it into the DNA of our operations. Right. And then, and then very, again, this inconsistency, maybe now uh, we're beginning to make the trade-offs between working hard and being safe, and, and we're not really focused on safety anymore, which you can see now leads to the injury in week eight. That's right. So a after the injury, what happens is a feeling of helplessness if all of you have as a results indicator. But in this case, we're focusing on, on getting into a rhythm of consistent training and improvement. We're looking for a rhythm that helps us be better. So we're making safety important. 
on page 218 in the Rhythm book, you use the section heading of use KPIs and dashboards to make critical adjustments. And this is just an example of making a critical adjustment and improving your business week over week. Yeah, you know, you start, we start off the, uh, the webcast with the uh, beautiful video scribe that, that you built. By the way, Barry built that video scribe really pretty. I don't know how to do that. And uh, you showed, we talked about actually how, uh, and this is the example that we demonstrated, how, you know, the, the, the result indicator turned red in week eight. Right. And as you pointed out, we really couldn't, if that's all we're focused on, it gets rather demotivated. And that was that heavy weight that yeah. the team carries and they're helpless because they can't change it. Right. They will not change. So, so here's the big aha that I want everyone to take away. Here's the key learning point, right? I want you guys to write this down. That you need a rhythm of improvement and getting stronger and better. So if you look at the leading indicator, you can actually be inspired and motivated to do better and, and make sure you make a safety briefing every week so that next quarter you're better prepared. That's right. And that's one of the differences of not having a leading indicator help you. And the line item on the bottom of the screen, that weekly safety training, is a KPI that will help us drive results rather than sit and just measure the uh, actions after the fact. Right. Okay, so uh, of course I would love to show you other KPIs for other departments, uh, but we took the time to dive deep in this time, uh, a little bit of how we do it in our deep dive sessions. And so, you know, you would also want to do KPIs for finance, operations, research and development. And by the way, I'm not just talking software companies. I mean, all companies have research and development. Uh, shareholders, are your shareholders happy, etc.? your employees, and of course your customer service. So we focus today on chapter eight of your new book, Rhythm. Yes, and we covered a few things. The power, uh, well, we covered the power of leading indicators and dashboards as the first item. We also then showed you how to develop leading indicators to drive results. And then we also showed you how dashboards can help us create solutions that drive those results. And then, you know, finally, we actually did two deep examples, uh, one for sales and, and one for manufacturing. Mm -hmm. uh, so we have a few minutes left, Ryan. Uh, do we have any other questions? That, uh, yeah, I've got a couple of good questions here. One is from Brianne. Uh, Brianne's asking, does a KPI always have to relate to a business problem needing to be solved? So... Um, Again, it's hard for me to answer that question without more context. I would say most of the time, yes, we're either solving a problem uh, or we are tackling an opportunity. Okay. So when I say when I say problem, I'm being a, a little bit of a mathematician here. Uh, a problem is not necessarily a problem, but it's really working on something that you want a solution for. So it could be a problem, or it could be an opportunity that you're really uh, working strongly on. But I do not believe in measuring. API is just to measure because you know what someone has to do the work and then my question is once the work is done what are you going to do with that? Thanks Patrick. I got another question from Eugenia. She's asking do you recommend to have two leading indicators or for each result indicator or is it better just to have one leading indicator for each results indicator and how many should I have? You should have what you need to get the job done. So I like less is more because you know the fewer indicators you have uh, the more focused you can be. So if it's possible to prioritize and have only one, that's great. But if it's not, I wouldn't beat yourself up. You know, I'd have two KPIs which are leading on there, and it's fine. I'll share with you one example. You know, over here at Gazelle Systems, every week we look at our finance dashboard. We actually have three leading indicators on there uh, regarding our cash to help us manage the company to make sure we can grow with our own funding. So we have three leading indicators there. It works very well for us. So I think you need to have the, the correct number of, of indicators that help you solve the business problem. If you need to look at it from three different perspectives or three different directions, please have two or three. But if you only look at it from one perspective, please limit it to one. <clears throat> Thanks, Patrick. Dave has a question. Uh, he says, you know, sometimes we struggle with measuring leading indicators as we have no control over when work is received. Um, if it's hard to get good data to measure a leading indicator, is, is estimating okay? So, again, you know, there's no, there's no black and white here. I think we have shades of gray. Isn't that a crazy book? No, no, I'm not talking about that book. So, <laughs> we, we have shades of gray, all, all jokes aside. Uh, so, 
yes, you know, I love to get something I can measure perfectly, but if I can't, you know, estimate it, but make sure your estimate is good enough that you can have the right conversations. And By Christine, way, oh, go ahead. Yeah. So along, along those lines, um, uh, a CFO asked me once, you know, he, he shared, uh, a CFO asked me about how long it took for him to create this particular leading indicator. And then I asked him a question about uh, what was the main thing that drove those calculations. And he shared with me what the main thing was. And I asked him how hard was it to just get me a number on the main thing. And he looked at me and said, oh my goodness, to get that main thing, that's probably five minutes. So again, you know, instead of spending, uh, you know, three hours cranking out calculations to create the index, five minutes to give me a sample of the main ingredient in that index was probably good enough. <clears throat> Thanks. Thanks, Patrick. Christine has a, has a question. You know, how does this apply to an HR department or employee uh, examples of metrics? I think that's a great question. So again, uh, the question would be, well, what are you trying to learn from your employee base? So in other words, uh, you would say, okay, I'm trying to learn about whether or not my employees are happily engaged. Okay, great. So then you would create a leading indicator to figure out <clears throat> if your employees are engaged. And we have a couple of different examples on that. But again, it comes back to what question you're really asking. Uh, somebody may say, you know, I want to figure out if, uh, if, uh, if I've, I've, I've got a quality employees. Well, okay, then let's go define what an A player is, a B player is, a C player is, and then you can count how many A players you have in your company. You know, and finally, one example would be, I'm trying to make sure that our retention is good because it's expensive to recruit and retrain people. So in that, in that one, you would then measure your retention rate. So again, it's, you, you want to go back to what do you want to do to improve your employee base? Thanks. I've got another uh, question here from Peter. Peter is saying, you know, the examples you gave uh, measures results weekly. Is this always the case, or do some things need to be measured daily, or maybe on a different frequency, monthly, quarterly? How, the, how are they measured differently? That's a very big question. Uh, I like weekly for the, for the discussion of making these kind of adjustments to get to your quarterly goals. So I would say weekly. Now, in some cases, you have a daily key performance indicator. And that's great. So if you have a daily one, you would actually use that in your daily huddle. That works great as well. And then Anne's making an observation and a question. She says, it seems as though the, the leading indicators are driving specific behavior uh, rather than the results indicator that uh, indicates we need to sell more. Is that, is that correct? So I think the result indicator tells you what just happened, right? In other words, if you're driving, and one of the, on my, on my previous webcast, I use the metaphor of a car, and uh, you're driving it, results indicators of the results, the milestones you just passed. So it tells you the facts of what you actually achieved. And then the leading indicators will help you drive the behavior to improve your future achievement. So yes, I think what you'll notice in the uh, role play that we did here, I really wanted to emphasize the importance of having discussions about the KPIs that lead to actions. If you only measure it, put it on the wall, and you don't talk about what actions to take to drive behavior, I think you've missed 50% of the value. <clears throat> I got a question here from Greg. Greg's asking, you know, what happens, Patrick, if I, just, if I choose the wrong KPI? Um, if you choose the wrong KPI, it's okay. You know, it's a process. And, and by the way, I want to make sure that, that that's a very good question. Thank you, Greg. You know, it's okay. It's a process. So what you want to do is you want to get into a rhythm of improvement. So you want to, you want to test that. You want to measure. You want to test. And then if it works, that's great. If it doesn't work, then you look for another KPI to help you with your process. And then Paul, Paul's asking, hey, what's that fancy software you seem to be using to do your dashboards? Oh, well, it's called Rhythm, just like the book. <laughs> <laughs> Everything here is called good. Rhythm. Lack of, people say, gee, Patrick, don't you have any other name? Uh, no, Rhythm. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Oh, and someone wanted to know where to buy your book. And again, you can buy the book from Amazon.com or you can uh, go to PatrickTN.com. And that wraps up the questions, Patrick. Great. Hey, I want to thank everybody. And, and I know, Ryan, that you 
typically like to ask folks to stay for the survey and I love you guys to stay for the survey because you know I want to get there and I want to make sure we're doing stuff that you guys enjoy. Yes, thanks so much, Patrick and Barry. This uh, concludes the webcast today. And again, thank you for, for thank you all for joining us. Thanks, Patrick and Barry, for um, for teaching us today. And please help us by taking a minute to give us some feedback about the webcast when the survey pops up uh, as you exit the webcast. Again, thank you very much, and hope you have a wonderful day. Bye bye.